Headphone warning, I do tend to get very excited during these plot leak videos, so I'm warning you now, if you're listening to this video on headphones, go ahead and turn this video down. House of the Dragon, the up-and-coming successor show to Game of Thrones, has actually been under development since about 2016. Now, we didn't really start hearing waves or didn't start making noise in the media up until about a year ago. Well, after Game of Thrones went off and HBO confirmed that they would be picking up this show and not the other successor show that was supposed to be based on The Long Night or 10,000 years before the events of Game of Thrones. Basically a retelling of the origin stories of the others. It would seem very similar to Game of Thrones and that along with the a lot of the information that we received from the set of the show, it makes sense why they decided to go another route and focus on the Targaryens and their height of power. Dragons, tits, and incest is what made this show so great, and that's not really that existent if they were to go the route of the Long Night successor show. Uh, one thing everyone missed about what they told us about the House of the Dragon is that it had been picked up for an entire season one series, and that the pilot had been written by Ryan Condal, the guy who's being held as like the, the main showrunner. Shows do not get green lit without a pilot. Every single show in the history of television always has to have one of these pilot episodes that the public rarely gets to see to greenlight a show. It's what shows the executives what the show is capable of. They probably will never release it because it's rough and a lot of the casting will be recast and it's usually missing a ton of CGI, but House of the Dragon has had a pilot that was filmed. In this video, I want to discuss a potential episode one plot leak. You can't tell, but it's in air quotations there about House of the Dragon. Now remember, Take this information with a grain of salt, because it's more or less bullshit, but is in fact entertaining nonetheless. Here's your sign. Now, before we get started, please do me a massive favor and slap a like on this video. The like goal is going to be 420. <laughs> and also, this is the most important part, make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on. So that way you'll get alerted every single time I drop a video throughout this long night. I recently had a contest going for this drawing I did of the House Stark sigil and the House Targaryen sigil. The winner of that drawing is Kieran Bell. Please message me over on Twitter at Sir underscore Hunts for details about your prize. And a super special shout out to Brick23, Bloody Tyrant, Leah Hendrickson, Angie Delahanty, Nancy Toxteen, Marilyn Miller, Fred Wicks, Belladonna, Cater Talk, Joe Swag, and Damon Mayo. They are all members of my Patreon family over on patreon.com slash reviews. And if you all watching this video are interested, check out the link right up here or one of the links down below in the description. Now before I get into the plot leak, I just wanted to quickly address two things that I've seen a lot of questions questions about in the comment section. The first being where or what source material to read in order to know what's going to happen more in depth uh, about during the House of the Dragon or what time frame this events are going to be taking place of. Really the Dance of the Dragons. Now if you're unaware, Dance of the Dragons is actually referenced in almost every single piece of material that George R. Martin has written for A Song of Ice and Fire. But the most like well thought out and well detailed info comes from the Princess and the Queen, the Rogue Prince, my favorite A World of Ice and fire which has a bunch of other back history and information on the world of Westeros and really the world of everything related to A Song of Ice and Fire, then you also have most recently Fire and Blood, part one. And to be honest, a lot of that information in The Princess and the Queen and The Rogue Prince is actually in Fire and Blood. So if you really just want to read or get one book with the most information, check out Fire and Blood. George released that on November 18th, 2018. And according to him, it has enough material in it to write 17 Game of Thrones spinoffs. So make sure you go ahead and go Go grab that. And also, another thing that I want to mention, which is not really that important, I just feel like I address it, I'll address it now because I never really formally address it. It's it's the weight of Rhaenyra. Quite literally, Rhaenyra during her time was was known as being plump. She she never really lost the baby weight from when she had three marriages by the age of 20. So she was always resentful of Alicent being like a slim, slender queen who had, you know, also given birth to kids but was able to drop the weight much quicker. Now, in the books, that's a pretty important aspect of her character. It kind of makes more sense when you're reading her thoughts about why she reacts a certain way or why she has such a disdain for Alicent. But it should also be noted that according to Prince Daemon, Princess Rhaenyra is the most beautiful woman in all of the Seven Kingdoms. I personally do not know if they are going to to go the chonker route of picking a thicker actress to play Rhaenyra. It's not really, or nothing really is confirmed in the Seven Kingdoms until like we get to hear from the, the, the 
person's point of view. So like within the TV show, a lot of things that were described in the books as being one way aren't really practical for an adaptation, so they just sort of mush it down, like for instance, the scar over Tyrion's nose. Now obviously if they had done that, Tyrion, the actor, Peter Dinklage, who was in almost every single scene of the show, every episode, he would have had to wear a prosthesis over his face that would have probably, you know, sort of annoyed the shit out of him after a while. So what they did was, they had one character look at Tyrion's face and say, oh, it isn't that bad as if everyone's describing. So that makes me think that could be what they're gonna do with Rhaenyra's weight. Like, she may be a little bit thicker, but, uh, uh, one character will notice and say, according to the Seven Kingdoms, you're a fat little piggy, and now that I see you in real life, you're not quite that big. They could approach it that way. We have to realize that the maesters who are telling the stories about the, the Dance of Dragons, they're not that consistent in uh, their reliability. Like, we get to hear more their opinion of the events based on where their allegiances lie. And George does a really good job of showing their bias in their writing, and it's hilarious. Like, for instance, Archmaester Gil Gildalyn doesn't really think that the testimony of the mushroom is all that accurate, yet he keeps referring to it as a semi-canonical source. The maesters love to contradict themselves when trying to say who's the most reliable storyteller when they're not reliable themselves. Now, like I mentioned before, I am going to make a video on the testimony of the mushroom, but I, for one, believe more of what he has to say since he was actually there. A lot of the info we get from the maesters during this time are playing loyalties towards one side, so of course their stories are going to favor someone else over another person. Now before I start getting ripped to shreds in the comment section for being six minutes into this video and not having started on the plot leak, now according to this person, House of the Dragon Season 1 Episode 1 will start with a panning shot of Dragonstone. Six dragons can be seen flying in the distance. A horn is heard and the scene merges with the dragon rider arriving atop the Red Keep. It's Prince Daemon and he's on Caraxes, who is described as a bright red dragon similar to the size of Rhaegal during Season 7. The next scene is Daemon walking through the throne room, and we are introduced to the Greens. Aegon II makes a joke about Daemon looking old and poor. The prince informs Aegon that if he left the shadow of his mother and actually ventured outside the gates of King's Landing, maybe one day he wouldn't look like a cunt baby at his mother's teat. Viserys, the king, quiets both of them down, and then we are introduced to Alicent who enters the room and smirks at Daemon. This person goes on to state that the next scene is up north. The landscape is very similar to that of season one, as in we get a shot of the outside gates of Winterfell and they're surrounded by fields of lush green. We are then shown the Great Hall and Winterfell is in its prime. There is a feast happening and it is being held in honor of Lord Cregan Stark, Warden of the North, coming into his power. The scene ends with Lord Cregan and his uncle Bernard talking off privately in a corner. Uncle, his, Lord Cregan's uncle Bernard informs him that he is not ready for power and that the North is larger than any other kingdom combined and the responsibility is for that of a man, not a boy. The scene ends with Cregan Stark leaving Winterfell to call his banners for a war against his uncle who is refusing to release his grip on the North. Now, this person states that the rest of the episode actually takes place at Dragonstone. And in Rhaenyra's first scene, she is flying on the back of Cyrax, the green Shree dragon. She's flying with Lena, who is Daemon's wife, and her aunt is flying on Vagar. Vagar, now this is important, and this is not necessarily in the plot leak, I just want to add this, that Lena is a character in the Dance of Dragons and will likely be a main character. Uh, but the dragon that Lena Valerion flies is actually the dragon Vagar, rode by Queen Visenya during Aegon's con conquest. Now, Vagar is going to be one of those dragons that's probably close to the size of Daenerys' dragons at the end of Season 8. Well, I, I guess I halfway through Season 8, I don't know. But getting back on track here, this person says that Rhaenyra is flying on Syrax with Lena, who is flying on Vagar. They end up circling Dragonstone multiple times for several minutes during this scene, and during it, they're showing off their flight prowess, basically showing that they've been trained by professional dragon riders and have rode dragons nearly their entire life. We gotta remember, this is at the height of power during the Targaryens, so nearly every other person is a dragon rider. But after Lena and Rhaenyra fly till they nearly collapse from the sky of exhaustion, they land on the pebbly shore of Dragonstone just outside the gates and begin having a chat. It is then revealed that Queen Alicent and King Viserys' anniversary is coming up, and the Princess of Dragonstone, Rhaenyra, has been cordially invited. Rhaenyra shrugs off the news and wants to return to flying, but Lena warns her that skipping the royal tourney would be considered a slight to her father, the king, and Lena advises her to travel to King's Landing at once. 
Rhaenyra reluctantly agrees. And this person states that the end of the episode takes place with Rhaenyra departing Dragonstone on Cyrex after being told by Lena to watch after her uncle, the prince, Daemon, and that he will surely have gotten into some trouble in King's Landing. The last scene of the episode is of a hooded figure walking through a back alleyway which appears to be the streets of King's Landing and this mysterious figure arrives at a red door. The door is swung open and a drunken, half-naked, shirtless Prince Damon greets the hooded figure and begins to remove their robe. It is revealed to be Rhaenyra, and the episode ends with the two of them making insanely lustful love. Now, I could sit here and rip that plot leak apart, but I'm not really going to. We are still pretty early on, and, you know, as much as I know about the Dance of Dragons, clearly a lot of this stuff could potentially happen. This person actually wrote some cliff notes, so I do want to read those and share those with you guys. Now, they mentioned that the script could change to include a battle sequence with Daemon. Instead of Prince Daemon arriving uh, at King's Landing, on the back of his dragon and that's sort of our first introduction to him there could be another sequence with him sort of having his conquest of the stepstones they haven't really decided yet how far along in the timeline each character will be this person also mentions that king viserys was recast from the pilot episode as well as nine other cast members also that some of the winterfell plot hasn't been finalized the show will in fact feature a young cregan stark and he is said to look like rob but with dark features like john it's said that he looks more like a stark than Rob. Um, he also mentions, or this person also mentions, that there is a scene in Essos that wasn't filmed for the pilot because they ran out of money, but instead was described in the script. I'm not sure what that scene was. Uh, it wasn't listed. They also mentioned that the tourney uh, celebrating the fifth year anniversary of King Viserys I and Queen Alicent may actually be in the first episode. And then the last thing they mention is that there are more nude scenes in this show in the first episode than that of Game of Thrones. Overall, I thought that plot leak was interesting to say the least uh as far as like the amount of action that will take place in the first episode i'm pretty sure that like that person had mentioned there's going to be a battle sequence or maybe even some sort of tourney or something added to that first episode what's interesting is that during this time not only is it sort of becoming uh the perfect battleground for the dance of dragons to take place but there is war in parts of the world and the reason why i focus on battle and war so much is that miguel sapochnik the guy who brought us the greatest battle scenes in television and cinematic history is going to be a showrunner in this new series so if he has his way which he obviously will and i'm pretty sure he's going to direct a great number of these episodes there will be some heavy battle sequences if i had to pick a favorite part of this plot leak it was probably how the actual episode ended with rhaenyra and daemon making love that would be something that the average show watcher wouldn't be expecting and it is something to rumor had have happened in the books according to the testimony of the mushroom prince daemon actually taught rhaenyra how to pleasure a man and y'all gotta realize during this time Damon is supposed to be fucking everybody so if this person is correct in the very first episode of house of the dragon ends with a scene like that well then that'd be a huge callback to the very first episode of game of thrones with cersei and jamie having sex and subsequently pushing bran out of the tower well all right i'm gonna wrap this video up i want to thank you all so so much for watching if you could please slap a like on it the like goal is going to be 420 <laughs> also make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on so that way you'll get alerted every single time i drop a video throughout this long night and once again the winner for that contest is kieran ball uh please direct message me over on twitter at sir underscore hunts with your info i plan on doing another giveaway for one of my drawings again soon i'm working on this portrait of daenerys super special shout out to every single member of my patreon family over on patreon.com slash sir hunts reviews and i want to thank you all again so so much for watching my name is mark and this has been sir hunts <laughs> reviews <laughs> One of the things that got me interested in the television series Game of Thrones, aside from titties, was 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 the dragons. I ever since I was a little boy, I was obsessed with two things: dragons and werewolves. The dragons obviously are a part of this story, and in this video, continuing with my theme of mostly doing content related to the up and coming series House of the Dragon, I'm gonna discuss the actual creation of dragons. Uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire, in this world that George R. R. Martin has created, the actual creation of dragons is still a bit of a mystery and something that's much like everything with the origins in this world up for debate. Now before we get started on this video, please do me a massive favor and slap a like on it. This like goal is going to be... <laughs> 
420. <laughs> also, make sure you're subscribed, and this is the most important part. Make sure you have your notifications turned on, so that way you'll get an alert every single time I drop a Game of Thrones video throughout this long night. Now, jumping right into things, just as a, a, as a bit of a briefer, for those who are unaware, dragons are neither male nor female. Well, oh, okay. Sometimes they're male, sometimes they're female, but according to the historians, dragons can change their gender like a flame can change direction. And according to history, the only true way of determining whether a dragon was male or female was if a dragon laid eggs, it was considered to be a woman, and if a dragon never laid eggs, well then they considered it male. Alright, now to get a little bit deeper, dragons are, are originally found by these... A race of these people called the Valyrians, which everyone I'm sure is aware with is aware of. Daenerys and Jon Snow on the television series are the last of these really in, in this world that we know have direct lineage to the Targaryens that ruled uh, Westeros to begin with. But they start out as sort of like humble uh, shepherds and, and herders. And then uh, in the continent of Essos, which is across from Westeros, they discover dragons in something called the 14 Flames, or basically this ring of volcanoes that is pretty sure has an intense heat to the area, which probably likely helps to uh, hatch these dragon eggs. We do know that blood magic in, is involved, and that typically requires a sacrifice. But one of the things we know for certain is that intense heat heat and flames are also involved. This is why a lot of the maesters think that Dragonstone is the perfect place to hatch dragon eggs, and some of them even think that if you take a dragon egg too far away from it, it will never hatch. Uh, after a while, if a dragon egg has never been hatched, then it, of course, fossilizes. And Daenerys, at the beginning of our story, was given three fossilized dragon eggs, and just to show you how, you know, like, uh, important and valuable those are jorda tells her that one of those dragon eggs could buy her a ship and a small army to go and try to conquer westeros now what's interesting is that when starting this story or when creating this universe george actually wanted to set the valyrians apart and in doing so he gave them you know traditional pale hair and purple eyes which are like high fantasy typical features of like uh elves but he entertained the idea of instead of actually having dragons, he wanted to give the Targaryens or the Valyrians some sort of pyrokinetic ability, like uh, basically telekinesis involving fire. Like they could somehow use their natural given magic to manipulate fire, and this is how they conquered and had an entire civilization over in Essos, which eventually conquered Westeros. Well, that's clearly not what he decided to do, and he wanted to give them actual dragons. And the way they control dragons is something that's lost up to mystery. Now, I personally think that what we were given just briefly, I've mentioned this in several videos before, but what we were given information on Arya Targaryen and Fireworms and what happened with her when she flew off on the back of Beleriand the Dread and sort of disappeared into Valyria... Uh, when they return, she is infested with fireworms, and this led Septon Barth to believe that uh, dragons were actually created from Valyrians who would use blood magic to manipulate, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, a fireworm and a wyvern. Now, to just sort of quickly go through what a fireworm is, they're worm-like creatures that look very similar to dragons, but they do not have any ability to fly. However, they do possess the ability to breed dragons. Uh, when the Valyrians first encountered these creatures, it was in their minds, and they would often find, like, charred corpses of slaves that had encountered them, and they knew... Uh, they that knew that a fireworm was responsible for these charred corpses and like burning their slaves because there would always be like giant cracks and holes in the rocks and fireworms actually possess the ability to carve straight through rocks now wyverns on the other hand in at least in george's universe uh look very similar to the dragons except for they do not possess one key trait that's the fire breathing uh, a lot of them tend to be fairly smaller than dragons but some of the wyverns are so much smaller, they hunt in packs of like a hundred or more, and they're like some of the most deadly wyverns. So in conclusion, Septon Barth believes that the ancient Valyrians used a combination of wyvern stock, fireworm stock, and blood magic to create what we now know as dragons. And as sort of evidence of this, uh, a lot of people or a lot of the historians cite that the fireworms were present in Valyria before the actual dragons, even though there are some... Scholars from Ashai that argue that the Valyrians took the dragons from Ashai and turned them into slaves and manipulated them into mass weapons of war. Everything, 
like I mentioned, as far as related to origins in this universe, is can always be debated because George didn't write it as like a solid, solidified history. He wrote it more accurately to real world history, which is you take you have to take into accounts from everyone who was alive during that time frame and take all their points of views and sort of put it together and then sort of like determine from yourself, which is true. Like most information, uh, the actual like ability or the reasoning behind the Targaryens and the Valyrians ability to control dragons is sort of lost to history. But one thing the Targaryens in particular know that if they mate with each other, uh, which are particular like fathers, Mary's daughters, uncles and knees, cousins, um, aunts and nephews, since they marry so much in the family, that's how they continue, they know for certain, will continue to control dragons. The ability is passed down in their genes, which is like a major point in this story is that bloodlines are essential and key to ruling Westeros. The same can be said with controlling dragons. Now we are getting towards the end of this video and one thing I want to mention before I wrap it up is, is the color of dragons. They are described as beautiful, insanely intense colors, and that's something that I look forward to seeing in this up-and-coming House of the Dragon, but there's really very not much information that we know about how a dragon's color reflects its personality. Like, we know for certain that black dragons, for the most part, Drogon and Balerion, tend to be in Cannibal, I believe, was a... Uh, a black dragon as well, but they tend to be the largest um, when they're born in clutches of like several eggs at a time. Black dragons tend to be the most ferocious, the largest, uh, and usually tend to grow the quickest in size. Uh, uh, another thing we know is that red dragons tend to be the most vicious or the most ferocious of fighters. And there's one person in particular in the House of the Dragon in the up-and-coming Game of Thrones spinoff series. Sorry, I feel like I have to say that it's like trademarked or something. But Daemon Targaryen rides Caraxes, who is a red dragon, also known as Bloodworm. Now, the reason why I mentioned Caraxes' red color and like what we know about them being ferocious is that Caraxes died taking out a dragon that was a lot larger than he was. Uh, it happened in the Battle Above the God's Eye, which is something that I mentioned before, but basically Prince Daemon Targaryen fights Prince Aemon One-Eye Targaryen, and Prince Aemon, being on Vagar, the larger dragon, sort of like claws at the belly of Caraxes and, and tears off one of his wings, but Caraxes, being such a badass, vicious dragon, he's able to rip the throat out of a dragon larger than him, uh, Vagar. He, he rips her throat out as they land in, in the water. They all die, but... Red dragons are known to be ferocious, black dragons are known to be the largest and to grow the fastest and just to be the most powerful overall. I'm super curious to see where this show House of the Dragon is going to play since we know that there are multiple dragons that are alive during, at least in the beginning of the show, I want to see how they attribute uh, dragons' colors to their personality. It's kind of a thing in the Game of Thrones television series and way more of a thing in the books, but I just want to see this new series expand upon that. You all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. All right, well, I feel like that's a good spot to wrap this video up without taking out too much of y'all's time. Please, if you could, slap a like on this video. The like goal is indeed <laughs> 420. Uh, also, this is the most important part. Make sure you're subscribed and make sure you have your notifications turned on so that way you'll get alerted as soon as I drop a video throughout this long night. I've been getting a few people telling me that they're not actually getting their notifications from... Uh, YouTube for whatever reason, so just go ahead and double click and make sure you tap that bell to make sure the notifications are turned on. A super special thank you to every single person watching this video and a super special shout out to Brick23, Bloody Tyrant, Leah Hendrickson, Andy Delahanty, Nancy, Toxteen, Marilyn Miller, Fred Wick, Belladonna, Cater Tot, Joe Swag, and Damon Mile. They are all members of my Patreon family over on patreon.com slash their hunts reviews. And if you are watching or interested in joining, check out the link that's popped off during this video or one of the links down below in the description. I want to thank you all again so, so much for watching. My name's Mark and this has been Sir Hunts Reviews. <laughs> Once his mourning for his wife and son had run its course, the king moved swiftly to resolve the long simmering issue of the succession. Disregarding the precedent set by King Jaehaerys in 92 AC in the Great Council in 101, Viserys declared his daughter, Rhaenyra, to be the rightful heir and named her Princess of Dragonstone. In a lavish ceremony at King's Landing, hundreds of lords did obeisance to the realm's delight, as she sat at her father's feast at the base of the Iron Throne, swearing to honor and defend 
her right of succession. Now that is a quote from Fire and Blood and is really the defining moment in the Greens versus the Blacks. Uh, King Viserys wanted his daughter Rhaenyra to rule upon his death and never really stuck with what his grandfather King Jaehaerys or the old king established in a great council of 101 AC that the Iron Throne can never pass to a female heir and instead must go to a male heir. I see initially King Jaehaerys had the Iron Throne going to his son Aemon. Aemon dies and then it went to his brother Balon. Balin died and it skipped over his daughter Rhaenys who will likely be a character in this new series House of the Dragon. She is known as the queen who never was. But all that aside it was established from that point forward that the Targaryen succession must pass to a male heir skipping over any female heir even though they are technically next in line for the throne. Well when Viserys took over from his grandfather he changed all that because his male heirs had died. He grew up with Rhaenyra sitting at his feet and always observing meetings. She was his cup Bear, which, you know, we saw Arya being Lord Tywin's cupbearer in the TV series, and you can sort of realize that that's kind of like a steward at the wall. They get to, with Jon Snow becoming the steward to the Lord Commander, you know, being next in line for her. A cupbearer when in Rhaenyra's youth, she was privy to a lot of information and was sort of groomed in the affairs of running the Seven Kingdoms. And in this video, I want to discuss a potential plot leak for House of the Dragon Season 1, Episode 2. As always, take this information with a grain of salt, because it's more or less a load of horse shit, but it is entertaining to say the least. Now here's your sign and let's begin. Now before we get started, please do me a massive favor and slap a like on this video. This like goal is going to be something like 420. <laughs> also, and this is the most important part, make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on so that way you'll get alerted every single time I drop a video throughout this long night. And a super special shout out to Brick23, Bloody Tyrant, Leah Hendrickson, Angie Delahanty, Nancy Toxteen, Marilyn Miller, Fred Wicks, Belladonna, Cater Tot, Joe Swag, and Damon Mile. They are all members of my Patreon family over on patreon.com slash reviews. And if you are watching or interested in joining, check out the link down below in the description or one of the links that pops off in this video. Now before I jump into the plot leak info, which I will shortly, I just want to share some information that I came upon across my many uh, travels and adventures and discovering as much info as we can about House of the Dragon. We gotta remember, and I say this in every video, this show has been under development for four years. There is some information out there there that is yet to be uncovered or confirmed rather and I have a very strong inclination that over the next few weeks and months a lot of that information is going to start being released. One of the things that I found throughout my many delves into this like sort of information backlog was an interview that happened in 2016 with Ryan Condal and none other than George R. Martin. Now for those of you unaware Ryan Condal is actually going to be the lead showrunner alongside Miguel Sapochnik for this new series House of the Dragon. Now the interview in question is actually done by IGN and they're talking about or the uh, pretense to the interview is the golden age of sci-fi and fantasy. Now this interview is pretty revealing and I highly recommend every single person watching this video go watch it right now but some of the things I took away from that interview include wait 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 before I say anything about that now George R. R. Martin recently and I'm gonna get back to that but George R. R. Martin recently has been updating us frequently about the Winds of Winter and I'm gonna keep my info or my take on that information very short. Winds of Winter is gonna be here soon. Like, I believe it'll be here December, January, early next year at the latest. The reason why Martin is frequently updating us on how much he's writing is because it's getting closer. Martin is no fool, and he is known for pushing deadlines for years, and he's aware of that. It's sort of like this uh, meme at this point, like, we're going to get Winds of Winter in Christmas 2020, never. But in Martin's update on his Not A Blog site, he mentions how he's writing for several characters and how he's got a writer's assistant, and his days basically consist of him waking up, having his writer's assistants bring him coffee, and then he just bang, bang, bangs away at multiple chapters and multiple characters, multiple POVs in the Winds of Winter. Like I said before, keeping this short, I believe the only reason why we're getting so many Winds of Winter updates is because it will, in fact, be released soon and it'll coincide with a bunch of news that's going to come out with House of the Dragon. Well, getting back on track here and referring to that initial interview with Ryan Condal and George R. R. Martin with IGN back in 2016. Now, the pretense of that interview was the golden age of sci-fi and fantasy, but there are several moments to take away from that. One of them being is uh, sort of asking, when, when Condal is asked a question, uh, and not verbatim here, but basically he's asked, what is uh, his future going to be like? Is he going to be a writer like George? And, you know, Ryan Condal is running the show 
Colony, which is like a sci-fi space series, very similar to Game of Thrones, but he's asked if his future will consist of uh, writing on some old typewriter somewhere in the future. And he says, you know, for right now, I'm super excited on the medium that television is transformed into, and this is not verbatim, but he basically talks about how he's super excited for what's been done with television in regards to Game of Thrones and what can be done. And when he says what can be done, he actually looks over at the camera and looks at George and smirks. Now that information by itself is really nothing to take away except for you gotta add in that Condal had just spent several minutes explaining how his favorite series of all time is A Song of Ice and Fire. And that was actually a massive influence in growing up and while he decided to write Colony. Colony is, in, is a show about aliens invading but he mentions that the aliens don't really show up. And that's really sort of a key story note in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, magic and, and dragons and and White Walkers are all sort of secondary plots to the main plot of family drama. And since George's biggest influence is literally just pulling from straight history, it makes more sense why he's retelling that story but then adding, adding in small fantasy elements because he realizes that fantasy, and this is a quote from him, is like a pot of soup. And when you add just the right amount of salt, the taste becomes perfect. But if you put too much salt and you put too much magic and fantasy in your story, then that becomes all you can taste. But what I'm getting at here is this interview and those sort of questions that were asked were all jumbled in with Ryan Condal several times in the interview asking George questions about directions of his story or why he chose to do things or explain things rather in his story the way he did. For instance, one being the Targaryens. At first, George thought that maybe they would just have sort of a telekinesis-like fire ability and he instead decided to include actual dragons. This leads them to talking about what CGI is capable of doing right then and and that was in 2016 and what it will be capable of doing in the future and they both look at each other and sort of smirk and when you combine that info along with other information uh with that george has given about the fire and blood book and how the dance of dragons is basically the main center point for this first part of the book and how there's really a lot of source material there george kind of dances around those questions and it's as if him and ryan condal during that initial interview that i was just talking about are sort of avoiding going too deeply into that topic this was around the time that five spin-off shows had been rumored to be under development, but from what I took away from this whole interview is that Ryan Condal and George R. Barton are great friends. Uh, I believe they bond over their mutual love of fantasy and sci-fi, which is something that George and Dan and Dave kind of, we didn't really get to see that much evidence of. This looks as though Condal worships George, and that's important to have heading into this next series. A mutual relationship of respect and understanding, and that Ryan Condal will rarely make a decision about the direction of this show without consulting George. George first. And George makes it seem as though the reason why he had some differences with Dan and Dave is the reason why he hates doing TV in the first place. George has had a long history of experiences of writing pilots or writing adaptations to stories and them never being picked up by Hollywood. So he has a very salty, uh, salty feelings towards the whole Hollywood uh, industry and how they treat certain writers. Well, that's uh, something that's not going to be really worried about with this next show. Game of Thrones has proved to be the most successful television series of all time for like 10 years. So that fear that HBO might have had about choosing or allowing George and the writers to go in a direction that will or would be considered risky storytelling is over. They're going to allow George and Ryan and Miguel Sapochnik to all have free reign over the show and I'm most excited about that. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the leaks. Now this information actually comes to me from the same person who gave me a bunch of information about the episode 1 plot leak in several of the background information like developmental details. So if everyone watching this video wants to catch up on that and haven't seen it, check out the link down below in the description and go ahead and go watch that video for the episode 1 leaks before you watch this one. I've linked it down below in the description for your convenience. This person states off this new batch of information with a casting confirmation and so far this is the first, according to them, only 100% confirmed casting and that's for Queen Alicent. Now the actress that is going to be playing Queen Alicent in this new show show, according to this information, is Sarah Wayne Callies. Now, I immediately, like, sort of dropped my head down low and was like, what? 
I know her as Rick's wife from The Walking Dead. When I looked into a little bit more information on the validity of this, I was like, okay, that's really random. Uh, she's attractive. She does have features that could be translated into Queen Alicent. She's got a long history of acting. She's been in several movies. She's definitely A-list when it comes to television actors and actresses. But upon digging, the biggest thing that was like a, a red flag going off that maybe this might be legit is the fact that Sarah Wayne Callies has been one of the major characters on Ryan Condal's series entitled Colony. So she has the experience of working with Ryan Condal and the filming schedule may or may not be an issue because Condal is the controller of the Colony series and I'm assuming wouldn't allow the schedule of the filming of the two shows to conflict and if he's gonna have to choose one of the one over the other well then obviously House of the Dragon would win. Now I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about that because this is a plot leak video not a casting video so you all let me know what you think about Sarah Wayne Callies as potentially being casted as Queen Alicent down below in the comment section. Now this person states that episode 2 will start out with loud drumming being heard throughout the fully reconstructed dragon pit. And in the notes about this scene, they say that the lead up shots to the scene are the same background scenery we saw in many seasons of Thrones. One of which is where Tyrion is escorting Jon to the dragon pit to meet with Cersei in season 7. They mention that 500 extras are going to be used for this scene. The opening scene will last for about 10 minutes, and multiple shots feature the many events of the tourney. The crowd is shown to be having the, quote, time of their lives. And at this time, the kingdom, uh, meaning the Seven Kingdoms, Westeros, and, uh, is the most prosperous it's ever been thanks to the old king. And Viserys was known to be a, quote, partier, so this scene will mainly show how extremely extravagant the parties that Viserys threw were. And this is, of course, in honor of his fifth year anniversary marriage to Queen Alicent. And this person states that the tourney ends with Daemon flying in on Caraxes, who is a massive red dragon. And before the dragon lands, Daemon leaps from the dragon and lands at his brother's feet. The crowd erupts into a frenzy of cheers and laughter. Prince Damon then removes his crown and kneels announcing that he has conquered the Stepstones in honor of his brother, the king. Viserys first then stands up and declares that the Seven Kingdoms have never known a greater knight than that of Prince Damon. The scene ends with King Viserys and every major character eating. This person mentions that this is the first and only time in the entire series that the Greens versus the Blacks are in the same room in the same scene all at once. And they go on to mention that Otto Hightower, who is the hand of the king and Allison's father, asks Damon if he plans to stay in the Red Keep or in Flea Bottom with the filth and states that Damon prefers the company of whores than that of his wife and his brother, the king. Damon then responds by laughing and shouting that Sir Otto has grown weak with his age and prefers the company of books, not women. Now, in the notes for this scene, the person mentions that the rivalry between Prince Damon and Sir Otto Hightower is established. The dialogue hasn't been 100% confirmed, but the rivalry and the hatred for one another will be established as a driving force be behind these two commanders in the wars to come. And this person goes on to mention that later on in the episode, Alicent, Queen Alicent, and Sir Otto Hightower, her father, who was the Hand of the King, are having a very Cersei slash Tywin-esque moment. The two of them are discussing succession, and it is then revealed that King Viserys' health is failing greatly, and that the laws established by the old king in 101 AC would make her son Aegon II the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, as King Jaehaerys, the old king, established that a king's son and male heir would take precedent over any older female relatives and heirs. Alicent responds that Viserys has long since established that the next in line for the throne is Prince Rhaenyra, Princess Rhaenyra and that to oppose it would bring the greatest war ever seen in the Seven Kingdoms. Otto, inter Sir Otto Hightower interjects himself and ends the conversation stating that surely King Viserys will be dead soon, and she will need to act quickly if she wants to secure her family's future. Very, very uh, Tywin Cersei, if you ask me. Uh, they go on to state that he suggests that Prince Daemon has been manipulating Rhaenyra for years, and that if she were to take the crown, it would be as if Lord, as if the Lord of Flea Bottom would sit the Iron Throne, and we would have a Maegor the Cruel version too. Otto. Uh, 
Alicent's father knows of Prince Damon and Alicent's troublesome past and uses this to manipulate his daughter into agreeing to his plans. Sir Otto Lynn tells Alicent to prepare herself. War is coming. The scene then ends with the rat catcher being shown outside the doors of the Tower of the Hand where Queen Alicent and Otto had just been talking and the rat catcher then slips into the shadows and after the scene cuts to black, the rat catcher is shown relaying this information to Mysaria and she is known as the Damon's ma Mistress of Whispers. And this person states that this episode ends with Prince Damon and Rainier departing to Dragonstone as he revealed to her the plot uh, against her father. And they decided that it is likely best to depart the city to Dragonstone, where Rainier has less enemies. Upon arrival, they receive word that King Viserys has succumbed to his illness, and the scene merges with bells being rang and can be heard all throughout King's Landing. This person Person states that this will be a massive callback and foreshadowing to when Daenerys discovered King's Landing. And they state that the episode ends with a dragon screech overpowering the sound of the bells ringing. Now, in my opinion, that was a lot better than the first episode of the plot leak that I received from this person. Obviously, I could break it apart and dismantle it, but I want you all to let me know what you think about it down below in the comment section. In my opinion, the most compelling part was the dialogue between Sir Otto Hightower Handy the King and Prince Damon. We do know that Prince Damon was never given the title of Dragonstone, so if Otto is going to mention something about him not loving his family or wanting to spend time with his family, I definitely think that the motivation behind these two, Sir Otto Hightower and Prince Damon, who are going to be major players and major characters in this new series, the motivation behind them needs to be established early on. If you can show that a lot of these characters already hate each other before the actual Dance of the Dragons breaks out, then it makes it even more juicy and delicious when we're serving treats like the death of Damon or the death of Rhaenyra. But alright, I want to thank you all so, so much for watching. If you could please slap a like on this video, as the like goal is going to be <laughs> white for <laughs> or 20 <laughs> also and this is the most important part please make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on so that way you'll get alerted every single time i drop a video throughout this long night and a super special shout out to every single member of my patreon family over on patreon.com slash sir hunts reviews i'm gonna thank you all again so so much for watching my name is mark and this has been sir hunts <laughs> reviews <laughs>